This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 11 on Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 44. 12. John the Baptist feeds 5,000. Good to be back with you. Uh, We're continuing to work through uh, Mark chapter 6. When we first looked at uh, chapter 6, we got into in the first six verses that uh, that rejection that Jesus received uh, at home and the the irony of having um, had this amazement from uh, the crowds, this acceptance. We've had these great displays of teaching authority of power and miracles, of, of exorcisms, and this growing uh, clamor. Then he comes to his hometown, and, um, and it, his meager beginnings become reasons for uh, rejection and, and the, the lack of faith or trust that Jesus was uh, uniquely positioned to, uh, to do such, such great acts. Uh, we, we, we looked at that and, and the irony of it. And, and that, in a, in a little way, is interesting, sets us up for this next uh, part of chapter 6. Now, when we get in this next part of chapter 6, we have another occasion of what we would call the, the Markin sandwich. Again, that, this is a, that, that idea where a story starts, and then in the middle of the telling of that story comes uh, a new story, and then uh, the first story resumes. And, and what we have here is this beginning uh, in of the uh, Mark chapter six, the last part of verse six, this discussion of the work of the twelve, uh, and how the twelve are an extension and are, are going down into ministry, doing very similar things to uh, what Jesus was doing. And we'll look at that. But then, in the middle of that, we get this account of John the Baptist and the beheading of John the Baptist—a very abrupt interruption into this story. And then, and then after the account of the beheading of John the Baptist. We, uh, we, the disciples return, and this actually, the return of the disciples sets the stage for the great feeding of the 5,000. So as we, as we look at the, uh, these first few verses and the work of the 12 and the discussion of, of the disciples, keep in mind that this is in concert with what will happen regarding John the Baptist. And, and, and I wonder, if to some respect, the, the reason Mark does this big flashback to the beheading of John the Baptist, to his martyrdom, uh, is because of the way it, it works in conjunction with the idea of discipleship. That as the 12 are being commissioned and sent out, there, there is this component of discipleship that cannot be lost in the Gospel of Mark, which is uh, the idea of suffering uh, and, and suffering for the faith. You know, the, the idea of uh, take up your cross as a, as a model of discipleship. And of course, this is in context of leading up to uh, Jesus' own declarations from chapter 8 onward that the Son of Man must suffer. So with that in mind, uh, let's look at uh, the work of the Twelve uh, as, this, as this section starts out, beginning um, and with um, the middle of verse 6. So the first part of verse 6 starts with the ending of the account of how Jesus, like most of the prophets, were held without honor in their hometown. uh, So picking it up, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, Shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached the people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So we have a set of instructions that, that has occurred here. This uh, Jesus has been going around from town to town, which we know was his purpose. He never stayed in one place very long, but continued to move around. And then he sends out the twelve. Now, in the calling of the twelve, you remember earlier in the Gospel of Mark, the, the first set of instructions that he gave them was to simply accompany him, to watch him, to, to see what he's doing. And, and now we get the second set of instructions where they are going to go out without him. 
He's going to send them out, and they're going to be doing the very same things Jesus was doing. One, they're going to be teaching. We, we see that. Uh, it says they went out and preached that people should repent. This is in concert with what Jesus was preaching. The, the, the overall theme of Jesus' preaching is uh, repent, the kingdom of God has drawn near. So they're giving the same message. They're talking about what Jesus is discussing. He, he, they are anointing people with oil and healing the sick. In other words, they're doing these, these healing miracles that Jesus himself was doing. And it also says that they, they were given authority over evil spirits. And this authority uh, you know, is this idea of Jesus' authority now belonging to the twelve to cast out evil spirits. And these have been the three main things we've been seeing. Exercising demons, authority over demons, authority over illness, authority in teaching. So the, the, the twelve here are really an extension of what Jesus' ministry has been um, you know, so far. And it's very clear the way Mark is shaping that. It's interesting, uh, the, the two by two that he sends them out two by two. There could be some reasonings before, for that. One is just, uh, uh, it's not a safe to go alone. But the, the two by two probably, I think, reflects this Old Testament injunction idea of the need of two witnesses to confirm something. And so here they're going out uh, with this uh, two people who can confirm the legitimacy of, of what has occurred and also what is occurring. So that when they report back what has occurred, they also reporting back with the, the two witnesses' verification. The, the injunction is to take nothing with them, um, you know, uh, except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Sandals are fine, not an extra tunic. Uh, that instruction, some have uh, thought that that um, resembles a cynic beggar idea, uh, the, the beggar's bag, if you, if you will. Um, more likely, this is, uh, takes has a consideration of a symbolic act um, in the way that Elijah, you think of Elijah and what, um, what, what he had, or even John the Baptist, there's this simple attire, there's this basic provision, and it conveys a dependence on God. Uh, it conveys that they're not going out um, already sort of with their uh, financial support in place, but that there is a dependence on God, which really is, is, is a motif of even goes back to the wilderness of the Israelites having to convey a dependence on God as they were wandering uh, in the wilderness. And, and then I think there's also this, um, this presentation that they're not coming into a town with vestiges of honor that might be associated with status or with wealth, that what the value that they bring is in their message uh, and in their ministry, not in, in their possessions. The, the, the comment about where they should stay, if a place welcomes them uh, to stay there uh, and not go to, not to go to other places. I think that has the idea of um, one giving value to those who first welcome them and their message and not seeking to upgrade, if you will, not seeking to, as other people are accepting, if there's a host who says, hey, why don't you come stay with me? I've got a villa that's a little bit nicer, that they don't seek opportunity for gain in honor, for gain in status, for gain in, in wealth by uh, uh, seeking out people who might be more receptible later on, but not initially. It, it locates it within those first receptions. And it gives high value to the importance of hospitality. In an ancient culture, hospitality was extremely important, still is in, in majority parts of, of the world. And, and their remaining there gives value to this virtue. There is something uh, important about the reception of the, the, those carrying the message. And in fact, what strengthens that is we see there's the opposite side. There's a judgment motif here as well. When, when Jesus instructs them that if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. There's a, it was not uncommon that when those would, who were living uh, in the diaspora and were sojourning uh, back to the Holy Land or had visited and were coming back, that when they crossed into the Holy Land would shake the dust off the clothing of the foreign lands. I mean, there is a symbolic um, 
uh, move of this is not part of me, this is not welcome, I do not want to carry that. But even more, this shaking the dust off uh, idea, I think, has a language of, of judgment you know, with it, that there, that, um, there is a uh, now statement being made of, of separation. Um, if a place doesn't welcome them, then they won't um, uh, have anything to do with that place. There's, there's a hint uh, of that there which is consistent with what we've seen with Jesus' own ministry, that there is both a welcoming and salvation, but there is also a rejection in place. And, and Jesus expects rejection as well. By giving instruction of what to do when a place doesn't welcome, there's an expectation uh, that the going out and doing the ministry of Jesus will have a similar response that Jesus has, which is some will accept and you honor them, and some will reject um, and you dismiss. Now, as we're into this process, though, we get this, all of a sudden, insert of a completely different account. We, uh, with, um, with verse 14, we move back in time to the, to the death of John the Baptist in verses 14 through 29. This is, we know this is a flashback. We know this isn't concurrent. We know that from 1.14. When uh, chapter 1, verse 14 talks about how the ministry of Jesus began after John's arrest. So this is, this is not a concurrent. Incidentally, this is the only episode in Mark's gospel that does not directly concern Jesus, which also gives it a sense of stress or highlight. Um, there's something about John the Baptist's suffering. There's something about John the Baptist's martyrdom that is uh, important for Mark in the telling of the story of who Jesus is. And when we think of John the Baptist even as the forerunner of Jesus, one of the things we note is that he not only was the forerunner in terms of proclaiming, repent, the kingdom of God is drawn near, of preparing the way for Jesus, but there is also a sense there's an identity that they share in their arrest and in their death. There is a, um, a contrast, of course, that's being made here as well between Jesus and uh, and what Jesus as king has looked like, and with what uh, the sham of the, the kin of Herod and their rule looks like. I want to look through uh, this, um, this beheading episode and then discuss it. So King Herod uh, heard about this, for Jesus had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. And so others claimed, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and, had, and he had had him bound and put in prison. Now, before we go on to talk about the account of John the Baptist, I want to address a little bit what, what is occurring here in these first set of Verses. So the um, Herod here has has heard about what Jesus is doing, and and the crowds are saying. Some are saying that uh, this is John the Baptist raised from the dead, and and that is why miraculous powers are working him. And others saying he is Elijah. Now, what's uh, what's interesting in this is we're going to see another say one of the prophets we're going to see this response come up later when we get to mark chapter 8 and jesus asks the question of the disciples who do the people say that i am it's going to be very similar to what we have here and what this what this means that there is this um, uh, coalescing explanation of why it is that Jesus is able to speak as he does, why it is that he is able to do the, the wonders that he can do, uh, and, and they're trying to find categories and boxes to, to put him in, one being John the Baptist, the other being uh, Elijah or one of the prophets. And I think as we get the sense of this, I mean, there is this, this question here where Herod, it should be Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great, he was over the region of Galilee and, and Perea, that we get this idea of or this question of how is it possible that people are saying this is John the Baptist when 
John the Baptist and Jesus would have been seen simultaneously, at least some would have been aware of that John the Baptist even pointed to Jesus and, 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 and talked about how he was unworthy, that here was the one. And of course, the baptism of Jesus uh, would have also been known by at least some at this point. And, and you know, in other words, like, there were people who would have seen Clark Kent and Superman at the same time. The idea, you know, this isn't one person now pretending to be the other. They would have been seen together. And, and I wonder if the sense of it, and it, it connects with this Elijah, and the Elijah overtones are always present with uh, John the Baptist, always present. Even, even his martyrdom uh, story here, uh, there are similarities between this and Elijah's conflict with Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, there's, there, are, there are connections to be drawn. But I wonder if the story of Elijah doesn't also help us understand how it is that people are thinking John the, uh, that Jesus is John the Baptist, or Jesus is even Elijah, or even one of the prophets. And, and part of that response is not that they consider this to be a reincarnation, if you will. Um, there's some elements of that. I mean, obviously, Herod, uh, Antipas here, is thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, how can this be John the Baptist, or is this John the Baptist? But I wonder if, what, if looking at this, if this isn't the idea of the spirit of John the Baptist, or the spirit of Elijah, or the spirit of one of the prophets, in the way that when you think of the Elijah, Elisha story, there's the mantle that Elijah then gives to Elisha, and then we hear the account with Elisha that, that Elisha um, you know, has the power of Elijah, has the spirit of Elijah, is, 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 is the, 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 what was associated with the presence of Elijah now is associated with the presence of Elisha uh, in, in a way that unites them. And, and so this might be a little bit um, of what I wonder is, is at work here in these, in these answers rather than simply only an understanding of somebody who is dead has come back. Um, it's, it's, it's a, I think there's some thoughts to consider there. So, so uh, Herod, Herod Antipas here is hearing about this Jesus and the explanations of who he is. And um, uh, when Herod heard this, picking up verse 16, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had bound him and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet liked to listen to him. So setting up this, this standpoint, uh, what's going on is here is um, this political intrigue. And in the middle of this intrigue, you have of Herod Antipas, who is now married to Herodias, who was the wife of his brother, Philip. And John the Baptist is speaking against that. When he says it's not lawful, he's talking about this is not lawful within the law. This is not lawful. For this, this marriage is not um, holy and is not righteous. We're going to find a little bit later in the Gospel of Mark the, this question of is it law in Mark chapter 10, is it lawful uh, uh, you know, for a man to divorce his wife. This question is going to come back up, and incidentally, it's going to come back up in the same area where this whole controversy is taking place, indicating that some of the motivation for that question is, is probably less, what is your opinion, but may perhaps more um, setting, the, setting Jesus up to perhaps receive the same uh, result that happened when John the Baptist was making similar statements. But we'll We'll get to that. So there's this, uh, um, John the Baptist is a very overt critic. He, he was, uh, Herod was doing that which was forbidden in the Old Testament. Now, Herodias is already, the wife, is, is already against John and wants to kill him. So her motivation is, is clear. Yet Herod doesn't comply because of two reasons. One, he recognizes the, uh, the holy and righteous nature of John the Baptist. He recognizes that what John, the, John is doing 
uh, is, uh, in, seems in keeping with, with God's design, and there is a hesitancy to kill someone uh, you know, who's keeping with God's design. It's, it's, it's interesting when we think of, we'll have a hesitancy later on, of course, in the story of Jesus and his crucifixion by Pilate to do something similar. But also, he doesn't want to do it because he liked to listen to John, even though he didn't understand him. That's, I think that's a fascinating uh, picture, that there was something about John's preaching that drew Herod, yet he did not understand. He had enough of an inkling to know that John was righteous, holy, <coughs> but was puzzled by what he had to say about the kingdom of God drawing near, about repenting, perhaps even about um, the one who is to come. It's hard not to see a connection between Herod here and <coughs> the crowds who are confused and amazed simultaneously. They are amazed at what Jesus is doing. They marvel at his teaching, yet there isn't a full understanding. But also even the disciples. We're going to see just uh, in, a, in a chapter or so where Jesus walks on water. And they uh, are said to be amazed and perplexed and even hardened. Which we'll, which we'll get to that. So this, this figure, in other words, of, of, of Herod, who's about to do this um, horrible deed to John the Baptist, there's some sense of, his, of understanding that his reaction to John the Baptist is not dissimilar to reactions we are seeing to Jesus. And even if we think of, of the Pharisees and the Herodians, if you remember the the, the man with the withered hand where he's healed, the, uh, the, the Pharisees and the Herodians aligned together to kill Jesus. You know, their desire was to kill Jesus. Um, there's, there's a sense here of, of what even Herod Antipas, who is hearing John the Baptist, yet um, recognizing partially something on one hand, but not enough to, to, stand, to stand for him, that there are these other figures who are associated with him and his power who will be doing something even um, similar, if not worse, which is seeking to kill Jesus. So, so we pick up, there's this, there's this controversy between Herodias and Herod. Herodias wants him dead, and Herod is saying no. So at this point, the only reason John the Baptist hasn't been killed is because of Herod, because of Herod's um, liking to listening to him. Finally, opportune came. Verse, uh, opportune time came. Verse twenty-one. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, "Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you." And he promised her with an oath, "Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom." She went out and said to her mother, "What shall I ask for?" The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came, took his body, and laid it in a tomb. A very gruesome picture. Very gruesome. John the Baptist had been protesting against this incestuous marriage or this unlawful marriage. And here we have uh, this, this picture of a banquet uh, the, 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 this, uh, uh, full of the people who he would have honored. You know, these, these are not simple folks. These are po- folks with status. And, and there's a, um, uh, a, his stepdaughter doing a dance. Uh, and I think the, in, in the inclination here is a dance that was pleasing, that there was a, an allure, an attractive, a lustful quality as well. And, and in appreciation of this dance and the whole, and everyone's appreciating, he makes this wild promise with an oath in front of everyone. And so we have this, what a banquet under King Herod looks like. 
there is um, uh, dancing, there is, there is sexual overtones, there is, is drinking, there is a concern of honoring one another in status, there is uh, manipulation, uh, there's opportunity to get, now Herodias has the opportunity to get John the Baptist's head, there's fear of human disapproval, so even though Herod's conscience was to keep John alive. His fear of what the crowds might say, of what those who he has sworn an oath in front of, overcome this this partial recognition, at least, that John the Baptist was righteous and holy. And this, this desire to please human design leads to not simply only the execution of John the Baptist, but the presentation of John's head on a platter to which Herodias receives as a prize from her daughter. It's hard not to think that um, John doesn't intend for us to see at some level a foreshadowing of Jesus' death in here and the uh, the concern of public opinion, the, the concern of human designs, the, the uh, um, uh, ignominious way in which a death is done and presented. But also, remember, Mark has inserted this story. He's inserted this story into into two accounts. The account of the sending of the twelve, who had nothing, but went out and was seeking hospitality. Inserted into that account. And the conclusion of that first story, which has the feeding of the five thousand when the disciples return. You have one banquet full of disorder, full of debauchery, full of sin, murder, lying, manipulation, and so forth, hosted by King Antipas. And we're about to get a banquet hosted by Jesus that's orderly, that's full and and bountiful and generous, um, and, 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 and points to who... Jesus is. I think Mark intentionally wants us to see these two moments uh, together, which is why he inserts the story of the head of John the Baptist here. So we pick up then with, uh, after the story of John the Baptist, we pick up then with uh, verse 30, where the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. So he had sent them out, verses 6, end of 6 to 13. And here then in 30, we pick up that story with them returning. The apostles gathered around him. Interesting enough, this is the uh, only time uh, um, Mark uses the term apostle uh, in, his, in his gospel. Uh, and, and so here you can see apostles is already though being associated with the 12, this idea. And so there's this, this connection that is being, um, I think, being made. Apostle can mean sent ones, right, and ambassadors, uh, which also sort of fits the context. They were sent out to do what Jesus. And so they reported back to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. This is not an uncommon occurrence in Gospel of Mark. Remember, the crowds have one uh, primary job. In addition to being astonished, they get in the way of things. And here they are preventing Uh, even a chance to eat. And he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a remote place or choir place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Interesting enough, this is the exact same type of activity Jesus, after he ministers heavily, he likes to retreat. We, We even saw that in that first day at Capernaum where he went to a remote place to pray after he had been healing and exercising demons um, all day long. That he likes to go to a remote place. There's an importance of recharging. And Jesus recognizes that the disciples have been doing the same ministry that he has been doing and that the results have been very similar to these crowds going, that they need rest. And so there's a very compassionate move by Jesus here to bring them to a deserted place for rest. Now, we have an um, interesting cycle of events that is about to form. We'll get a feeding miracle, followed by a trip across the lake, and then a healing miracle. 
So we're going to get this feeding moment of the healing of the 5,000 that kicks off this particular cycle. Right after this, we'll get a second particular cycle that's kicked off by the feeding of the 4,000. Both of them will have a trip across the lake, and both of them will have a healing miracle. There'll be different miracles, but both of them will have this. Both of them will involve a dispute also with the Pharisees. In other words, I think Mark has set this up so that these two cycles are meant to be received similarly, that there must be, that there's a mutual interpretation that is going on. The details are different enough that uh, I do not think these are the, the same event being told two different ways or being received two different ways because the, 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 um, the numbers are distinct. And one of the things we know about oral tradition is that um, numbers were a detail that often did not change. That numbers are sort of one of the anchors in forms that would come down orally. And so the fact that we have these different numbers, one is a, 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 would indicate that these are different um, uh, accounts, different events, even though there's some similarity. And I think Mark intends for us to see some of these similarities. So they come back and they want to go to this remote place. Could also translate that as wilderness. Perhaps there is an, uh, an echo here. We're about to have a miraculous feeding in a remote place. Miraculous feeding in a wilderness. Perhaps some manna from heaven, Exodus idea. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But the crowds run ahead of them. So they go to this remote place. Now come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Then at verse 33, But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So there must have been some idea uh, of they knew where they were going. And even though it says they got in a boat, uh, the idea here is they must have been going along the shore where the crowds would be able to run ahead, not crossing over. And so the crowds run ahead. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. And I think it's very important the reason he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. That idea of sheep without a shepherd, I think, is important here. The, uh, the idea of a shepherd as, as a metaphor for a ruler, for a guide, for uh, a religious leader, or even for God, is not uncommon in the Old Testament, is not uncommon in Second Temple Judaism. Um, you know, for example, in Numbers 27, Moses, when he's uh, speaking for Joshua, you know, recommending him, desires for Joshua uh, to lead so that Israel will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Ezekiel 34 speaks to a time when the people will be scattered and devoured by animals. They will be like a people without a shepherd. One can't help but think of the Psalms in this consideration, where, where God is a shepherd, thinking of Psalms 23 or Psalms 80. We see Isaiah 40. The Messiah will come from David um, uh, and, and will be a shepherd, right, in Jeremiah 23 and Micah 5 and Zechariah 13. So as Christ doesn't just have compassion over their state of hunger. He recognizes that here are the Jewish people without a shepherd, without any real leaders. They are shepherdless. And then the, and the answer to it is not the feeding. The answer to it is his teaching. He had compassion on them because they were sheep without a shepherd, which probably is, is also speaking to the fact that how they were so rushing to him that they finally had some sort of sense of a draw with his teaching authority. So he has, and his compassion motivates him to begin to teach many things. Of course, in this teaching, uh, uh, you know, it says that uh, by the time it was late in the day, by this time it was late in the day, so his 
disciples came to him. And I think the idea is also the length of the teaching, not just the length of the day. And they say, this is a remote place, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, we we need to be clear, the disciples aren't being hard-hearted here. They're actually interrupting Jesus' teaching to bring attention to the fact that these people are hungry and they need to eat, and, and before it gets too late, you need to dismiss the crowd so they can go places and be able to purchase food uh, and to be able to, to feed themselves. And there's nothing in this setting that indicates um, the disciples at this moment are somehow dense. They're recognizing need. So then which Jesus says, he affirms that there's this need. He says, you give them something to eat. Now, keep in mind, this is in the context of they've just been doing amazing things. Healing, exorcisms, teaching. This is in the context of that return. He says, you give them something to eat. And their, their response is basically, we don't have that kind of money. They're, they're, uh, uh, it's not... Um, you know, feed them with what you have. They, they understand Jesus to be saying, you go to the towns. I'm not going to dismiss the crowd. You go to the towns and you get the necessary food. And, and their response is that in essence, that, um, uh, that would take, uh, in my translation, eight months of a man's, of man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And then, so they're, 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 they're unable to think of any other possibility of feeding. And Jesus' response, of course, is, is uh, very pragmatic. Um, tell me what we have. How many, how many loaves do you have? And he asked, go and see. And when they found out, he said five and two fish. Interesting on the five and two fish. There's a lot of debate of whether there's symbolic imagery in that number. It says the five represent the five books of Moses, does the two represent the two tablets. It's always hard to, to say. Um, my, my sense here is probably this is what they had, which was five loaves and, and two fish. So I'm a little less um, uh, likely to see symbolic imagery in that amount, though this event itself is full of symbolism. So then Jesus directed to have them all, all the people, sit down in groups on the green grass. One, again, this is orderly. He even sits down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Um, and in this ordering of things, you wonder, too, if there's not even here this idea, if there is Moses imagery, we're in the wilderness, we're about to have a miraculous feeding, we're going to have the number 12 represented. We're talking about sheep without a shepherd, which is... You know, Israel and God relationship or Israel and king ruler relationship. That even if this orderly account doesn't draw to mind uh, the organization of Israel by God into, into, into the groups when they were coming into the promised land. Perhaps. I do think the green grass imagery here is very interesting. It's a, it's a level of detail. It says that he directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. Well, perhaps it's just historical memory. Or perhaps there is a connection Mark is wanting us to make with Psalm 23, 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That this shepherding, the Lord is my shepherd idea, then connected with green grass, green pastures, that Mark is, is wanting to say, look, This isn't just a feeding. There is imagery of the Lord providing. That there is uh, imagery of of a messianic banquet. There was this, when one one thought of the time of the Messiah and and at the, the eschatological arrival of salvation, it was often in a banquet form. And here we have orderly seating. This isn't like Herod's banquet, his birthday banquet. This is different. There's orderly seating. And it's on a green pasture full of shepherding imagery. And then, and then Jesus um, uh, takes, these, takes these five loaves and these two fish, and everyone is fed. And everyone is fed to their full. And there are even baskets 
that are uh, brought in. The surplus of food, I think, is not unlike Elisha's feeding of the hundred with the 20 barley loaves. Fascinating here right, is this, this idea then, and, and I'll finish up here, is this idea of who actually saw this miracle? I think this is one of the questions that we ask. And if I'm reading Mark correctly, the only ones who saw this miracle, this feeding of the 5,000, of course, the, the, the number here would probably would have only referred to the men. So there were probably would have been some women and children, so the number is actually greater. The 12 baskets, perhaps again, restored imagery of Israel involved. Every disciple has a basket. But there's no account of amazement or wonder by the crowds. And I think that's important to note. In Mark, whenever something miraculous happens to the crowds, he is quick to tell us they were amazed. There's no account of amazement here, which I think lends to uh, the, uh, the idea that it is only the disciples that realize Jesus in the wilderness Five loaves and two fish became enough to feed everyone. Therefore, it becomes a setup. This story sets up what we're going to see next, which is the miraculous account of when Jesus walks on water. This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 11 on Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 44. 12. John the Baptist feeds 5,000. 